Uh, good morning, and so glad to be with everyone this morning. Uh, I'll keep working on admitting other folks as they um, may come in. Um, but before we begin, um, just like to take a minute, I'll, I'll say an opening prayer. Uh, Laura will give some invitations. I'm going to meet everyone. And then um, you can unmute yourself when because we're going to have time for some collective conversation. So I'll give an opening prayer um, that we all can pray <laughs> together. And then Laura will bring us into what we'll be doing today. And then um, we'll go from there. So hang on just one second. Um, oops. OK, I now the settings are now that you should be able to unmute yourself when the when the time comes. So. Uh, thank you again to everyone just for your presence. Um, it's really moving just to even see you and to be in community in this way together. Um, and, um, you know, in this time, there's those moments where I'm sure we, many of us have felt, you feel like, oh, people, right? <laughs> like I'm still connected to, to real people. And so seeing your faces just brings my heart a lot of joy and hope. And so let us, uh, let us begin this time by just opening ourselves to the God who, who is present already with us and loves us. Let's pray together. Loving God, we, we give you thanks for this morning, for breath, for life, and for your love. Oh Christ, we know you are already present. But by, may you, by your gracious love, continue to need and work within our souls the work of your, your good news, of your kingdom, of your freedom. God, indeed, by your spirit, may you breathe in, on, and through us that we might be your people. It's in Christ's name we gather and pray. Amen. So Laura, can you bring us a little into just format wise and what we're thinking for this space? I will, yes. Um, I'm gonna use notes just cause that helps me stay grounded to where we are. Um, but I just wanna start by saying welcome beloved. I'm gonna be drawing in our core values too as I ground us and just kind of set um, the expectations for this. If you are like my daughter, um, you are probably going to be impatient with this and be like, can we just get to it? If you are like my son, you are gonna be like, actually I need this to know what's coming so I can be prepared. So I'm just gonna ask you to um, be patient with us if you are more like my daughter as we just lay this out so that everybody can feel like they know what's coming and what to expect. Um, we are very glad that you are here. It's our hope that we um, are able to encounter Jesus and that um, we are invited to transformation. Um, naming a few things that are going to help us set the space. Um, first of all, what we're doing here together this morning is still in the process of being formed. Um, this is the messy path of, path of faith, and we don't have a culture in America for nor in the church really for, do for doing the work of anti-racism. Um, that isn't something that's really been set. So it can be scary and unsettling because we are tearing down strongholds. We are um, setting aside sins that hinder. And um, it's a little bit like doing some surgery. Um, we're, we're digging in to some stuff and that can come with some just some unknowns, some, um, yeah, just some real tenderness, um, fragility, just a lot of things. And so um, I just want to be reminded in the midst of that, though, that we can be confident, um, just as scripture says, that we have a great crowd of, cloud of witnesses, of ancestors, of elders, of the angelic, of God's spirit. Um, cheering us on and we have each other um, so that whatever can be shaken is shaken um, and that what cannot be shaken may remain and I think that's what um, we're hoping for. Uh, secondly, I just want to note that as we wrestle with the tensions in God's word and in the world, um, 
which are very apparent. Um, let us be reminded that anti-racism is not a battle against white people or black people or any human beings. Um, our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So in our processing and in our discussion, um, we are confronting these forces within ourselves and within ourselves only. We're not going to be speaking um, on behalf of any other person, any other group, any other organization. Um, we are speaking on behalf of ourselves, our own experiences, and our own reflections. And lastly, we are asking that we bring our whole selves to this space. Um, our physical bodies, our thinking brains, our vast feelings, our indomitable spirits. We're holistic beings. This is holistic work. Um, and we are offering this as our worship to a loving God. And so I just am inviting us to immerse ourselves into this sacred space and allow the, the rhythms that we're going to engage with this morning to lead us into a greater experience of the fullness of faith in Christ. Um, it's in view of ourselves holistically, body, mind, heart, and spirit, that we'll be using the Courageous Conversation Framework, um, which in this context means we're going to invite ourselves individually to become aware of what it is that I believe, what it is that I think, what it is that I feel, and what it is that I do that perpetuates racism. Um, it's our hope that we fight against performance, as we come together, that we're not trying to be seen as woke or progressive or not racist or any of those things, that we not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, um, but that we think with sober judgment, um, allowing space for us to be truthful with one another about how we, fall short, how we fall short and allowing space for us to confess our sins to one another and to extend grace and mercy um, towards one another so that there can be healing collectively and individually. Um, just to reiterate the four agreements, we're asking that you please stay engaged with your whole being, and we will invite you into a process of becoming present with your whole being. Um, we ask you to speak your truth, speaking only for yourself and on behalf of yourself. Um, we invite you to stay with the discomfort to allow yourself to become more aware of what is being revealed so that you're dealing with the reality. And just a reminder that this is slow work and a long journey. So we're not, uh, we're not expecting this to be a quick fix or to happen, or we're going to be done with this at the end of today. Um, in fact, we're just scratching the surface. We ha only have an hour and a half today. So um, expect and accept that there will not be closure for what's going on. Um, the way that we're going to do this is kind of go with the five sections in the book and uh, Christian is going to give an overview at the beginning of each section and then I'm going to lead us into an invitation um, for us to identify each of those places where you are either knowing what you believe, knowing what you think, knowing what you feel, or knowing what you're doing. And then Sarah's going to lead us in the last section, number five, and then bring us into some closing after that. Um, so as we move into this time and as, as Sarah kind of opens us with um, just getting us ready for it, um, I just invite you to become aware of your body, become aware of your surroundings. Just take a look around you and notice what is around you. Um, notice the, you know, the colors, notice the light, notice the windows, notice any sounds. Um, just notice whether you feel like, are you safe where you are? Can you tell that? Do you know that? Is there anything that you need to be concerned about? Do you feel safe in that space? Notice how your, um, your body feels on whatever you're sitting on. Um, notice if you feel any, um, any constriction, any tension anywhere in your body. Notice if there are any feelings that, um, that we have just in our bodies that are being that we're responding with that are coming up for us and then 
Um, just take a deep breath. And then breathe out and just feel that in your body. And take another deep breath in. And then out. And then I want you to take two more. And as you breathe out, I want you to hum out so that you feel this in your, in your vagus nerve and in your system and in your vocal cords. So breathe in. <sighs> breathe in. <sighs> okay, and as we um, just move into this next part, I just want at any time where you feel yourself kind of like checking out to just check back in with your body, take that breath again, do something with your vocal cords or your humming so that you just feel yourself becoming present again and conscious and aware of, um, of, of your whole being, just because all of that is gonna be what we're looking at as we do this, so. Thanks, thanks, Laura. Yeah, so uh, just one comment before we you know, delve into the book then together. Um, you know, Laura, with you inviting us into breath, and that's where we also started, you know, here in this book, it ends, it starts and begins with the invitation into breath. And we've talked about this some at, at church, you know, that the Hebrew word for the spirit is breath. And just what it means for us as we keep breathing uh, to remember that breath is where the spirit resides and the spirit then opens us up and and that's where one of the things with doing this book, you know, and you highlight this, Laura, is I love how it says, you know, racism, anti-racism, and you. And just that the sense here is as a community of faith, we want to pay attention to where's where are God's invitations for us. And so absolutely, as Laura said, to to lean into the noticings, whether you in the reading or in the conversation, you're noticing grief, you're noticing pain, you're noticing anger, you're noticing confusion or all of the things at one time, like all of that's okay. And, and we believe God's big enough to hold us all in that. And so um, just the image or invitation that I wanted us to then take in, in terms of what Laura is inviting us to with breath is for us to go back to Psalm 1 and that sense of what does it mean for us to be a people who keep rooting ourselves in and keep like this is just one of those moments where again god's spirit can continue to deepen our roots that we might be people connected to the source of life and water and so sometimes there's some rocks that get in the way sometimes there's stuff going on in the soil and so might this be an invitation to all of us and so uh, thank you again to everyone for being here. And um, I just wanted to light a candle um, to, again, we're not in person together, but here we go. I'm going to light a little candle just to remind us that God is with us uh, as we engage together. So welcome, O oh Christ. Okay. Christian, will you bring us in? I will. Um, greetings to everybody. Um, it's really good to see you, even if it's, you know, 9 a.m. on Saturday morning. Um, and it's really heartening, honestly, that so many folks have uh, spent some time reading this text. I got to be honest with you, I wasn't sure <clears throat> who would be interested. And so, <clears throat> see, I can cry even early in the morning. So um, I'm going to also use some notes. So my job is kind of to, to just give a five minute synopsis of each of the sections. And I think the reason that we want to do this is, um, as Sarah and I talked about, uh, if you had a chance to listen to the podcast, and I think Laura may have said this just a moment ago as well, but we, we noted that like, we're not asking for us to agree or disagree with the book, but to try to understand the argument of the author. And so um, by doing these little highlights, what I'm trying to do is simply to set up the through line um, that Kendi, and then Reynolds wants to uh, to set up, and then Laura's going to kind of lead us into kind of discussion and whatnot. And I'll be I'll be participating in that as well, as everyone else will. So, 
Um, the first section, uh, if you note, um, just so I make sure I have the dates here, it, it's, they start 1415 and take it up to about 1728. <clears throat> and effectively, um, there's a big question, I think it'd be fair to say, in, um, in the historiography around race about exactly when does racial thinking begin? Um, and what are the dynamics that produce it? And they start the story in this book in 1415 with, uh, with Zurara, who is a, um, an associate or assistant or underling of uh, John the Navigator. Um, and that is one of the places where you often will hear that discussion. And it, it's effectively the dynamic that's created very early on in the story is that um, uh, it's not racism that produces slavery, it's slavery that produces racism, right? So it's the capture of a specific, beginning to capture specific groups of people, and then the need to justify why they should be captured and why they should then be put to work. That's the basic dynamic um, that I think it'd be fair to say that we see. And I think that holds actually pretty widely um, across the literature. And what that means then is that in part, the arguments around racism in, in terms of their origin and the way that the logic actually works has an economic component. And I think we wanna make sure that we keep that um, clear because that, and I think they do a pretty good job actually of showing that. So he talks about Zarara. Um, and I think early on, the other thing that I think is a particular challenge for us um, is the role that Christianity plays early on as well. So it's not just um, economics, there's also then built into the excuse for why we're gonna go and capture some of these folks and put them to work is that they need to be Christianized, right? Um, and so that same kind of logic, which this book doesn't talk about, um, is also going on, um, uh, for instance, in North America, when they begin to discover lands, the assumption is that no pagan could really control a land, only a Christian could control a land. So Christianity is rolled into this, or it's, I mean, and, and we could have an argument or a good discussion, I think about, are we talking about distortion of it, or are we talking about something that's in its essence? Um, I think it's probably more of a distortion, but, but those two things then are kind of bound together. So race, religion, um, and then the economic component are all sort of apart um, at times in the story, but they're particularly pronounced here um, at the beginning. Uh, he then notes that, um, that there are other theories, you know, so uh, the, the savage theory or the theory of needing to Christianize someone is one. Another theory for why these folks should be, um, uh, why they can be put to work is because of uh, the climate from which they come. Um, another argument is what's called the curse of ham. Um, and he really only gives snapshots of these, and I think the purpose of that is simply to show that there that they are that that their attempts to try out different ideas, and sometimes they stick, and sometimes they don't stick. And so we can see that there's sort of a panoply of ideas, um, and eventually they're going to coalesce and, and turn into something uh, that really looks like biological racism down the road. Um, after Zarara, the next most prominent figure, I think, in this first, first section is Cotton Mather. And, um, of course, Cotton Mather comes out of the Puritan tradition, and the Puritan tradition is, in large measure, like, that's the tradition that our own church is actually rooted in. And so that, that um, puts an, an interesting, I think, uh, a, a additional challenge uh, for us as we think about uh, what does this mean for us? So one of the things, though, that I can say that both goes into this book and goes beyond it, when I was at Bethel, I used to teach um, uh, Mary Rowlandson's captivity narrative. <clears throat> and one of the things that you see in the captivity narrative is uh, this, this, the assumption that the white person, the, the Puritan, she, is, she identifies herself essentially as Israel. All uh, right, she gets captured by the Indians, taken out into the wilderness. She goes through this whole um, experience. She understands it and interprets it herself as a kind of judgment. And, and so she's trying to make sense of her experience theologically. The, the, the reverse side of that, though, and, the, and this, is the, um, this is the part where they also pick up on this in the book, is 
as she understands herself as chosen and undergoing God's judgment, how is she going to understand the native peoples? She's going to understand them as the godless Canaanites. And what happened to the godless Canaanites in scripture? They were destroyed. They were accursed. And so part of the argument then I think of bringing in Mather and talking about this notion of, of sort of uh, seeing uh, the people, the Puritans as the new Israel is to show how that logic in others, others, right? Uh, it, it, it puts native peoples, it puts Africans, um, and it puts, what they, make, they make clear here, anyone who's not Puritan, right, who could also be Euro-American, they could be Anglican, in other words, they are all othered in a way that they become problematic. They become potentially servants of the devil. Um, they become, you know, so, objects that, rather than encountering them as people, they become objects to be resisted. Um, we then get a little bit on uh, sort of resistance to this, noting, and I think this is important to say, um, one of the reasons then, so if you, if you enslave, <clears throat> you, you enslave people and you begin to enslave more and more people, um, and you don't yet have a fully formed um, racial theory, uh, people are going to push back on this, right? And, and he notes that, the, so the, the Germantown Mennonites are discussed in 1688, and this is but one, you know, there are a number of other Quakers and, and whatnot. And I think the, the, con, the later than construction of racism as it develops and whiteness and, and all those kinds of things, as they develop, they become essentially the ideological uh, justification or ongoing enslavement or ongoing uh, dispossession. And so that's gonna be part of the story as it moves forward. Uh, one of the things I thought was particularly interesting also in this section, and then I'm gonna um, uh, stop, was uh, his interpretation of Bacon's Rebellion. Um, Bacon's Rebellion is one of the earliest um, uprisings that happens on the North American continent in the English uh, section. And um, it has to do with uh, effectively uh, uh, the rights of those who are living, quote unquote, on the frontier, and probably then are from the lower classes. Uh, they rise up. Um, <clears throat> they, there's a revolt basically against the governor, and um, the the rebellion is quashed. Um, but one of the things that, uh, that that they interpret out of this, and I, I, I myself would want to do a little bit more reading on this is that this is one of the first places where we see something like white privilege appear. And, and that appears because uh, what the governor does in order to sort of restore harmony is to extend um, pardons to everyone involved, but he can't extend pardons to everyone because this was a revolt of white, black, and Native American. And so he only extends pardons to the white folk. And so that's the, and so what we see then is a, it's sort of a historical accident, but it also then becomes again, another sort of plank as the, as this kind of is going to move forward. So I'll, I'll stop there in terms of uh, just the outline. Uh, he concludes that section with Mather and uh, the role of the witchcraft trials. Um, and uh, so I, I'll end there and let, uh, let Laura take over until we go back to our next section. Great. Okay. So for this one, we're going to be focusing on figuring out what it is that I, we believe um, about um, black people as either um, equals or as objects as kind of was portrayed in this first part. And uh, that may be coming from just what has come through the centuries, whether we, we learned it through the church or just culture in general. Um, so again, just wanting you to be present and noticing um, how, how some things that I say are going to hit you in your body and in your, your feelings. Um, I'm taking some of this from a book uh, recently read called The Anatomy of Peace and also from Martin Buber's um, philosophy of the I-thou or the I-it um, and how we're relating to people. So there's two ways of seeing um, and we're going to examine how um, how we see and we're going to know that through how our body kind of tells us because it's one thing to think we see a certain way but it's another thing to really kind of understand what our body is telling us um, so as i'm talking just take notice do these words have weight do they feel true um, 
Does it make you feel uncomfortable? Do you want to deny it? Um, there's just a, a, a bunch of a bunch of different things. So just want you to be noticing how you're responding to this. Um, two ways to uncover what it is we believe about black people. We can see black people as people who matter, like we ourselves matter. We are neither better than or worse than. So when you sit with some of these words, just see how they feel. Um, black people are civilized, intelligent, beautiful, capable, loving, created as equals, godly. Notice if there's any other words coming up for you along these lines. Maybe put them in the chat if anything feels like Also notice just if any of these are like, yeah, no, it doesn't, it, I don't feel that. There doesn't feel like there's a weight to that. It doesn't feel true, even though I want it to be. Um, okay, now I want to give you um, the other side and just see what that feels like in your body. Um, maybe, may feel true, but it also helps us see like what it does to us. When we, when we do hold that in our body. So we can see black people as objects that don't matter like we matter, so that we are better than. Black people are commodities, slaves, savages, inferior, wretched, evil, cursed, needing a master, inferior, incapable, unintelligent, childish, dangerous, impure, barbaric, All of those came from this first section, things that were portrayed or said or justified in terms of black people. So just notice how that feels and where it sits in you. What do you think a black person would say about how you see them? Um, do we know, do you know what matters to black people? Does what matters to black people matter to you as well? Are you aware of black people's needs as much as you are of your own? And lastly, to consider, do you believe the strategies, systems, processes, ministries, and programs in our church are built upon the belief that black people are people that matter like we do, or on the belief that black people are objects. Um, if you're feeling unsettled, uh, we wanna make sure that this gets processed in a clean way and not in a dirty way, um, which is alluding to the work of Resma Menachem in his book, My Grandmother's Hands, which is also what we're utilizing for this. Um, so if you need to, there are just a couple of things that you can do. You can hum, you can rock, you can ground yourself with touch, you can do some belly breathing, you can imagine yourself in a safe place, you can look over your shoulder or around yourself to recognize that you are safe and okay. And I want to credit Janet Hegberg with giving a list of things that she um, has pulled from his work that can be done with that too. So um, 
just as we move into this next section again, I just want you to make sure that you're getting your body into a place where you are feeling like you can process what it has been feeling and we can move into the next part. All right, Christian. Okay, so, um, and, and when we come to some spaces and times, I think when if folks wanna, uh, you know, raise a question or whatnot, um, we can also, of course, include what we will have already gone over as we move through, just, just so that folks are aware of that. So the, the next section is a little bit, it's a little bit, um, <clears throat> my, my comments will be a little shorter. Um, I think in some measure, Probably section one is probably a place where a lot of people uh, you encounter uh, several new things that you maybe didn't know about. Um, I think in section two, you're probably a little bit more familiar uh, to a certain extent because we're talking about you know the, the kind of the revolutionary period <clears throat> and the early republic. And um, it would be I think it would be fair to say that uh, in section two, the the principal figure who looms large is Jefferson, right? So Thomas Jefferson. And the way that he comes across, I think, and I think this is fair, uh, not just from sort of historiography around race, but just historiography of Jefferson, is that he's a complicated figure in this regard. Um, and uh, so, and they only mention actually at the beginning, the Enlightenment Writ, writ large. So the Enlightenment was a kind of a philosophical movement that's happening in Europe, and there's also kind of making its way across the Atlantic into uh, North America. And so figures like Jefferson and Franklin, <clears throat> they were considered also to be Enlightenment figures as well. Um, and uh, we get a very, you know, we get a little bit here and there uh, uh, in quotes uh, from Adam Smith or John Locke. Uh, and I think part of the reason I just want to highlight that is to say that sort of some of the central architecture, uh, like the central architects of what eventually becomes sort of the modern world or maybe even the modern worldview, uh, these figures are already themselves functioning within a kind of racial logic. They're already thinking about black people, um, people of color as um, uh, either inferior or, 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 or subhuman or maybe uh, they they begin to raise the question, maybe if they could become more white, they could be included in, in society. And so I think this is where we start to see the earliest assimilationist kinds of ideas um, that the book is overall sort of interested in. So we have, so there's really going to be three categories over the course of the book. One is the racist, two is the assimilationist, and the third is the anti-racist. And so uh, and they and their argument is that they want to move, you know, the reader and and all of us into an anti-racist stance, because that's a stance that effectively means a, a full affirmation of the humanity of people of color, predicated not on what we think it means to be human, but on what the, on 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 what it means to be human in a much larger sense. So. <clears throat> um, what we get about Jefferson then is, you know, the complicated element in the Declaration of Independence, right? The very first uh, sentence, all men are created equal. What exactly does that mean? Um, and I think at different times in Jefferson's life, it seems to mean different kinds of things, right? He's a slaveholder. Um, he, in his notes on Virginia, as the book discusses, clearly does not view um, uh, African-Americans uh, as uh, fully human. Um, or at least capable of doing the things that white people can do. Over time, um, however, he becomes opposed to the slave trade and its brutality. Um, he becomes um, also equivocal on whether or not slavery is actually good. Um, and yet the question of, well, what would happen <clears throat> if, um, if you did in fact free all these folks who were slaves, that question then is I think what produces then uh, assimilationist thought, can folks um, who had been enslaved and who um, by this point in time are theoretically thought to be deserving of having been enslaved, can they actually overcome that and be integrated into something? 
And that's also, of course, the other question is integrated into what? Integrated into the larger kind of Anglo white society. So assimilation is a, is a component part of that. And I think it, it, it also becomes then a, a strategy or a way of trying to deal with the material question <coughs> of the potential of freeing slaves and, and when people have an equivocation about slavery. But also they note, and I think this is important to note here in the book, um, they, note, they, they note black agency, which I think is very important. In the resistance to racism and the resistance to slavery, it's not, it's not um, well-meaning white people. It's often black people who say, no, I'm fully human, and they just walk off the plantation and they leave, right? They flee, they go somewhere else. They come up with their own ideas. Uh, and one of the things we're gonna see though is that that's not a straightforward story either. It's also complicated because they're gonna utilize ideas that are also at play um, uh, in the larger society, particularly when we turn to the section uh, section four, we'll talk a little bit about that. So let me, I'll stop there. Um, and, and as I said, so the, the, this is giving us, you know, the early period constitution, <clears throat> which, you know, has within it, written within it, three fifths of a human being is what a, is what an African person is uh, thought to be. Um, so this kind of this legacy uh, of slavery is at least initially enshrined. I mean, we're going to effectively, to some extent, the question is, are we going to be a slave society or a society with slaves? Um, early on, those are the options. Um, and neither of those seem very good, but uh, that's how things at least start. So let me stop there and see what kinds of comments or questions there might be. Um. For this one, we're going to move into what we think. And so I'm going to read a couple of lines from Luke 16. Um, you cannot serve God and wealth. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all this, and they ridiculed him. So this is talking about Jesus. So he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts, for what is prized by human beings is an abomination in the sight of God. Um, the you are those who justify yourselves. And um, that's kind of what I want us to think about and recognize what we think in this, in this part. Um, we're gonna be talking about the ethical versus the economic. And looking at Jefferson um, from the book, it talked about, you know, he was, as if he was struggling with what he knew was true and what was supposed to be true. Um, he expressed remorse for slavery, but still needed slave labor to pay his debts and pay for his luxuries. You know, and ultimately it says that he did not free any of the enslaved people at Monticello, despite his believing that slavery was morally wrong, cementing once and for all the winner in his struggle between the ethical and the economic. And so um, for us too, as we look at this in ourselves and we sense what is ethical, what is the right thing to do, we're presented with a choice and we can either honor our sense of what is right or we can betray it and choose not to do it. And it's a struggle in the midst of that, um, which is to say that we, we don't always, you know, like Jefferson, like many others and like ourselves many times, we don't always choose the right thing to do. Um, and when we do that, we are presented then when we choose what is not the right thing to do, we betray ourselves and we create a new need within us, which is to justify why we didn't choose the right thing. And um, so with Jefferson, you can see some of his justification as in, you know, he thought it would almost be like sending black people home from camp as he was trying to figure out, you know, like what, 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 would, what should we do? Um, that they would be smarter, stronger, ready to build if they were gonna be you know, colonized, sent back to Africa, like it was benevolent, maybe even forgiving. Um, he hoped that slavery would ultimately produce more good than evil. Um, he basically thought that sending black people back to where they came from would make America met, uh, what it was always meant to be in his eyes, which was um, from the book quoted, a playground for rich white Christians. And so this struggle um, to justify choosing the economic over the ethical when it comes to black people is still very much a struggle today. Um, the, the style of justification used by Jefferson and, and used often in many cases is a better than elevating ourselves above black people. Black people no longer count like we count. We feel superior and look down on them. And when we choose this style of justification, this, um, 
that we're better than black people, then it automatically kind of brings in this other thing that we deserve things that, that they don't. Um, and that is, you know, could be a bigger paycheck, a nicer house, more free time, you know, just different things like that. So in this one, just consider for yourselves, think of a time that you maybe chose an economic over ethical in regards to black people just in your thinking or in, you know, as you're looking at what's going on or maybe you're wrestling with some things right now um, between these different options, just with knowing history that's come up and um, looking at like, wow, reparations and redlining and all that kind of stuff. So um, if there's anything like that that you want to share, just for, we have a couple of minutes before we move into the next section, feel free to unmute yourself and just. Um, this is uh, Sam. One of the things that I was thinking about that actually was addressed with uh, the very first part of the book is when classism is brought up. And that was the uh, very first time that I saw white people that had uh, fewer or less means um, bring up the issue. And I think that that is in part what's going on for me here with this also about who deserves more is that all of uh, classism is entangled in all of this as well. Yeah, Sam, that's a great, <clears throat> I think that's a great observation. And I think that's, um, that's a key element of, of analyzing racial discourse. Um, one of the things I didn't mention that is not um, <clears throat> discussed in this book is um, the dynamics that produce the logic, the racial logic that some people um, can actually just, they deserve to be enslaved or they, or they should be objects from which we can extract wealth. That process is actually happening in Europe for about 200 years prior to initial encounters between Europeans and Africans or Europeans and indigenous natives. Um, and I, well, the one example that kind of always comes up in most of the literature is the, is the example of the Irish and the way that the Irish are treated, particularly by the English. And so, uh, it, and it's, it, it contains the kind of assumptions about, you know, the Irish people are less than, and one of the reasons why I like to talk about this is because I have Irish heritage, but it, it contains assumptions about Irish people being less than human, uh, savages, uh, people who are not willing to work their land, people who are lazy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the most basic justification when you really kind of bore down on it is it's an economic issue, right? The English, uh, want to control the land in order to extract the wealth and they're going to need labor to do that And so they're going to put the Irish to, to work And so the question of class is almost always wrapped up with this question and they can't really be pulled apart And I think one of the things that that this book also sort of hints at is that probably gender right because we get you get the you get the, the sense from um, the witchcraft trial stuff right with with cotton mather and the way that that disproportionately affects women uh that that's also an issue here uh, but but it's a much bigger thing to untangle and i would certainly want to invite sarah in because she's got even more analysis in that regard but that's a, i that's a really great observation though i think that's right michelle i think you put something in the comments i know i know not everyone equally pays attention to comments during uh, Zoom conversations. Uh, could you could you just name in response to what Laura was inviting us to, and and I just Laura, I really I appreciated you um, naming that about how thinking about what we know is right. And kind of I think of like the God given you know sort of sense of of what is right and within us, and what happens when we betray that, and how that leads to our own self justification, which I think you know so much of. There's so much in the Bible about that, about like what happens then when we begin to justify ourselves. Um, but Michelle, you had written something in the comments. Would you be willing to name that verbally? Yeah, um, one of the things that I've learned over the last couple of years um, participating in a project called Mapping Prejudice is how um, in Hennepin County, which is where I've lived my whole life um, for the most part, uh, 
redlining was used to create um, white neighborhoods and create spaces where um, black people or any people of color were not welcome unless they were servants. Um, and learning that, I guess recently, um, we live near Lake of the Isles and recently Mapping Prejudice put a picture of our neighborhood up on Instagram that really highlighted for me, um, I actually am living in a neighborhood that was created that way. And, and I think when, um, you know, when Laura reads that passage or when I look at Thomas Jefferson, I wanna really judge him. I want to, um, to be like, how can you like say these anti-racist statements and own slaves? Like that doesn't make any sense to me. And I realize, oh, that's kind of, that's what I'm doing. I am perpetuating um, by justifying where I live, the choices that I make, what I'm trying to do. And really it's like, I'm just trying to be a good person and I want to be nice to everybody. And, you know, I, we're just called to love everybody and that's what I'm supposed to do. But really, um, it feels like there's more and it feels economic. Um, and that, that can be scary when I start to think like, what would that actually mean? I'm, I'm wrestling with, with, with two, two concepts. One is uh, we're all equal and on a macro level, I can really buy into that. And yet on a micro level, individual level, some people are better than, my second concept, better than other people at some things. Maybe not overall, but on, on an individual basis. And that creates then judgment because I think some people are better than others at, at those things. And, and it, that kind of drags me into a, a judgmental mode. And, and I think that's especially true as it relates to race. Algen, would you, would you mind, um, that's interesting. Would you mind maybe just pulling that out just a tad more? What you mean the last part of what you said? Well, as I, <clears throat> As I make a judgment of some people are better than other people, like <clears throat> use the stereotype, the athlete is physically better than I am, uh, the, the, then and I and others aren't. I make a make a judgment about people, and there uh, I don't know how that relates to race, but it it ends up doing that. Uh, I mean, I think we categorize physical and mental capabilities as some races are better at that than other races. I don't know if that makes sense. Thanks for sharing, Elgin. Um, we're gonna move into our next session. And so Christian's gonna start us off on section three overview. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks for those comments. And um, we'll do our best again to be able to engage this and maybe we'll find some ways to create some sort of alternative offline discussion things too. Just given we have so many folks here and I think there's probably a lot of questions that are going to start bubbling and we do want to make sure we uh, we make it or make our way through as much of the book as possible, I suppose. Um, so section three is um, uh, I think it'd be fair to say, historically speaking, is taken up with um, sort of the organized rise of abolition, so organized resistance. Um, and then towards the end, <clears throat> we start to hear about the kind of, um, I don't know, the degradation maybe of that resistance as the abolition movements um, kind of have done their work uh, after the Civil War and they sort of close up shop. Uh, in, the, in a little bit too soon in the midst of reconstruction and you begin to see white backlash uh, starting to develop. And then as we turn into section four, you start to hear much more of, of how white backlash um, through creation of black codes and Jim Crow reorganizes itself 
um, and then pushes back on the gains that are made. So uh, it'd be fair to say there, I think there are kind of two groups of folks um, who show up um, uh, in this section. So there's Garrison, uh, William Lord Garrison, who you may have heard of before this. Um, if you've heard of abolition, right, this is the movement to abolish slavery. And typically the, one of the most famous of all these, aside from maybe Frederick Douglass, is going to be uh, William Lord Garrison. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that Garrison um, is really a very talented organizer and a very talented media person. And his newspaper, The Liberator, becomes a central component. And, and I think the other thing that we, we start then to see onboarded, and this actually, to some extent, I think probably intersects with your comment, Elgin. Uh, we, saw, we see the onboarding of mass media and the ways that mass media uh, plays a role either in perpetuating certain stereotypes that we have or potentially becoming a tool for helping us to organize. So uh, Garrison, in Garrison's case, it's his newspaper, The Liberator, probably the most famous, but not the only abolitionist newspaper. And I think the other thing that we hear then as, we, as, we, as we're engaging with this history is just to keep in mind, um, and I think they do a pretty good job in the book, that there are different types of abolitionism during this time. There's gradual abolitionism, um, which means that over time, uh, we will begin to set free the slaves because then it will be more economically feasible and that will give them time to somehow be ready to assimilate. So you can kind of hear how that might be problematic, but at least they want to get rid of slavery. Garrison, though, and say David Walker, Frederick Douglass, and others are committed to a kind of immediate abolitionism, which means, uh, which for, for many of them is simply a, an argument that this is sin and it must stop now. Um, it's not something that can, that can sort of just be stopped over time. Um, this also, I think, because of abolitionism, clearly raises the other question, well, what's going to happen after? So now, um, uh, thinking along the lines of, of assimilationist or segregationist, uh, those are going to become two categories to a certain extent uh, that we're going to begin to see develop. And I think we get uh, from uh, the reading that, this is, that some people can be immediate abolitionists and still be racist. Uh, they want to get rid of slavery, but they don't believe that black and white people can live together. Um, and the most complicated figure in that regard is Lincoln. Um, and Lincoln, I think, goes from being a segregationist to eventually becoming something closer to an assimilationist. But he doesn't move, you know, beyond that. Um, and of course, again, we, I, I do think we want to be careful as well as we're kind of going back in and we're wrestling with this, that the issue um, constantly that they have tried to remind us in the book, but it's hard sometimes to make the distinction is that this is not so much about people as it is about these ideas. So when we think about um, our judgment of, of a person like Jefferson or Lincoln, we want to think about it as a judgment of the ideas that they are perpetuating and living, at, living out. That's, I think, at least the, sort of what we get uh, from the book. And I think that's good advice insofar as we can, if we can uh, accomplish that. Um, the last component then in Section 3 is the <clears throat> sort of the, the – the sense that um, because these ideas exist and because they're so powerful, they're so able to coalesce power, and clearly we've already mentioned how they're entwined with economics, et cetera, um, resisting them is an ever, you, you, cannot not, you cannot not resist. And I think this is then where the, the door opens to, this is why an anti-racist stance is really the only option because the idea, racist ideas or even assimilationist ideas are so powerful that they will always suck us back. So the example then that's offered is when Garrison, when the Civil War ends, um, they shut down the anti-slavery societies and they, as they do so, it's right at that very time that Reconstruction begins to fall apart. Andrew Johnson becomes a president. Um, he, he offers uh, pardons to almost everyone in the South, particularly all of the white folk um, who participated in the rebellion. And, uh, and then they begin to uh, create effectively a kind of what's, what's sometimes, well, I guess it's not a new Jim Crow, but it's sort of a, a slavery by another name. 
through the black codes, through enabling people to be arrested with that little phrase in the 13th Amendment. Um, so you create laws like vagrancy or other things like that, um, which is easy to put onto black uh, folk who now don't necessarily have steady jobs. Um, and if they don't have a steady job, then well, maybe we, they, need, they can be arrested more easily. And if they're arrested more easily, they can be, then be put into a prison or into some sort of a, a encampment. And then we can get labor out of them, right? So that's kind of the ultimate goal here. So, but that whole story that remember that whole story, I think the purpose of telling it is precisely to show why they're arguing that an anti-racist stance really is the only stance because the power of these ideas are so great. And there's no, like, you can't undo history. You can only try to struggle in the time that you live in to, and to maybe create a new history, but that's going to require resisting ideas uh, like this. So anyway, I'll stop there for section three and turn it over to you, Laura. I'm sorry for going too long. No, that's fine. Um, so in this one, we're just going to try and um, put ourselves in the place of um, Black people to gain some empathy and some understanding and um, some awareness just of how, how this would feel. As Christian was talking, these ideas are very prevalent and the um, policies and procedures and laws and things that were done are also, um, they, they just have a tremendous impact. So um, I'm just gonna ask you to be present in who you are, in your body, be aware of all of that. Um, and just imagine yourself um, in this time as a black person. And I'm just gonna read some things from this chapter um, and just again, see like how, how this, would, how this would, would sit with you, how this would feel. So white people have justified choosing their economic gain over your humanity and equality. They continue to justify slavery and their own supremacy, despite the fact that black people, your people, were captured and brought unwillingly to this land, enslaved, drained of your abilities and knowledge of growing and tending crops, exploited for your physical might and your creativity when it came to building structures and making meals, stripped of your reproductive agency, stripped of your religions and languages, stripped of your dignity, American soil is sopping with your blood, black blood. Your DNA now literally is woven into the fibers of this land. You've been verbally, physically, emotionally, and sexually abused and traumatized. You've been hunted, consistently marginalized, told that slavery was good for you, that it was the will of God for you, told that you had less capacity for intelligence than white people because your skulls are smaller, condemned as insane if you are a free person, and praised as sane if you are enslaved. How do you feel about yourself? How do you feel about black people and their experiences? How do you feel about white people? One of the things I think the author doesn't deal with enough is um, the issue of freeing the slaves and what's going to become of them. Because they had been deprived of an education, like you said, all the things they'd been deprived of. And suddenly we're going to free these people. How are we going to assist them? I mean, some ideas were like um, giving them 40 acres of land, but the problem is then you've got all the poor white people and they're thinking, well, how come I don't get that too? You know, it comes back to the economics of this. And there's so many issues, and I think that's why there's so many ideas that, that rise up about this. They're trying to figure out, well, what do we do with this mass of people? I know I've, I read Uncle Tom's Cabin and Harriet Beecher Stowe thought maybe every white every white northern family should adopt a black slavery family. <laughs> well, they didn't even have families at the time they were broken up, but you know, they felt that they, and I suppose that's an assimilationist type of thought, but I think they were afraid that, not that blacks weren't 
un, they weren't able to do things, but they hadn't been allowed to develop their skills or they weren't educated. So, you know, I think it was a big problem back then that we, he didn't really deal with too much. Thank you. Um, we're going to transition. Sorry that we are moving so quickly, but um, we're going to transition into section four. So, Christian, if you want to go ahead and yeah, and I'll just um, as a to preface, just to respond, Judy. I think that's a great point, and it actually brings in the concrete material base, right? The the material base for uh, cultivating, realizing your culture. Um, and, uh, uh, there was a moment, I, I think it would be fair though, to say that the, the idea was not to take all of the land from the South. It was going to be to take the land from the planter class and then to divide that up into 40 acres and a mule. And basically that collapses once Andrew Johnson gets into office. Um, and he is much more inclined to be, um, benevolent towards, that class, um, because that's the, you know, that's the political and power base, um, et cetera, down there. So, but I, I think all of these are significant and important questions. And actually this transitions us um, into uh, section four. <clears throat> and one of the things I think is interesting in this section is uh, there, there's a couple of things. So what we get here, this might be a history that you don't know about I think typically most folks, when they think about the civil rights movement, they tend to probably start in the 1950s or 60s. And you certainly, you've heard of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, you've probably heard of some of the other figures. You may know about Malcolm X, et cetera. Um, but, but that sort of is, uh, is oftentimes styled as like um, the third wave of civil rights. Uh, the first wave of civil rights is in the abolitionist movement. The second wave of civil rights struggle is in the period here that we're talking about, particularly post-Reconstruction, um, up into sort of just before World War II. And that's really the, the, tr the track that we find, for the most part, that this one takes up. And then the third one's going to be the last section. Uh, Sarah's going to discuss that a little bit. What we get, what we find in this section then, is um, uh, I think the author does a decent job of introducing us to this debate that's going on among black the black intelligentsia, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, and then Booker T. Washington. These really are the two most um, uh, important figures, I suppose you could say, and they represent two poles uh, within how we're going to, uh, how, how are we gonna think about what does it mean for us to get free? Um, and, and what, what I found actually interesting, uh, and I'm, I know about Du Bois' work probably a little bit better than Washington, but I think I know his later work, and what I found out at least in reading this book, because he shows that Du Bois and Washington, even though they're arguing against one another, they're critiquing one another, they, they basically share a similar notion, which is that of assimilation. So Du Bois develops this idea of the talented tenth. Um, that there are certain talented individuals who can rise above their station and their um, uh, their struggles. Um, and those are the people that we really should be kind of um, encouraging. And so in some ways, like it's a, it's a recreation of maybe what we might call middle class politics in, in a white frame, but this is happening in a black frame. Eventually, I think Du Bois is gonna, um, he, in fact, they showed that he does kind of sour to this idea um, and he turns uh, less and less assimilationist and more and more anti-racist. Um, Washington also had been arguing for something similar in the, in the sense of um, assimilation is, is, I think his position is actually more of a mixture of assimilation and segregation, that um, black folks should do what they're really good at. They should only aspire to, you know, certain kinds of work. They should not be aspiring to reach the, the absolute heights that white people um, want to reach. And maybe that's the difference between Du Bois and Washington that we can see. Um, uh, we also hear, you also get to hear then some of the history of the early history of the NAACP, uh, the fact that it's also functioning in an assimilationist faction and that the one option, the alternative that's put out, um, which, is a, which is clearly a, uh, an anti-racist um, to a certain extent, 
or maybe I don't know if it's anti-racist, but it's it's very much a an alternative, and that's the Pan-African nationalism of Marcus Garvey, and he argues for a return to Africa, but I think he he seems to fit in the category of anti-racism in the sense that black people don't have to become white people to be acceptable. That's sort of the way that his position comes across, though leaving does still hold open this question of sort of the segregation uh, element. So I think what the picture we get, if we take all this together, is the complicated nature of resistance, um, that even as uh, black people and others are trying to resist the kind of racial situation in, in North American society, there are different positions. Um, there's a kind of, there's an array of, of approaches and that we're still not, to a certain extent, at least in terms of the, the people that we hear about in this particular book, the leading figures have still not sort of walked through a door frame that, that they would say is truly anti-racist. We're still functioning with, I'm gonna measure myself and my success and the success of my community by the standards set by another community, i.e. the white community. The other thing, the other uh, thread in this section that I think it picks up from section four is the kind of um, the growth of mass media. Um, in, in its perpetuation of uh, stereotypes and ideas. Um, and it was, I thought it was fascinating to read about, you know, Jack Johnson uh, and, and then the response to that being Tarzan, right? Um, Jack Johnson was this, you know, famous um, welterweight uh, champion. Um, and he basically, a black man, could not be defeated. Um, and it's not, I, you know, it's no accident that the movie Tarzan and essentially is a kind of response to that. Um, they talk about the birth of a nation, which winds up, you know, that becomes a very important, uh, you may have heard of that movie before, a very important um, cinematic moment that, that basically portrays a woman being raped, a white woman being raped by a black man, and the KKK has to come in and rescue the woman and set things right. And that, of course, becomes a major element in um, uh, justification for lynching in the South and the sort of the rise of the KKK. The 1920s uh, is like late 19 teens and 1920s is really the height of the popularity of the KKK. Uh, and then the last movie that they talk about, uh, which I don't, I don't can't remember, maybe it's in the next section, but it's uh, Planet of the Apes. So some of these are movies and certainly television shows that we have seen. I mean, I grew up as a kid watching the serial version, the serialized version of Tarzan. Um, I certainly saw Planet of the Apes. Um, and I, I think what, one of the things then that the book raises by putting that forward is to, um, to challenge the reader to think about, well, what is it that we're seeing when we're watching? Are there certain kinds of stereotypes that are being perpetuated um, as we watch this. And I, I want to share like one last anecdote here at the end. So, um, so I'm a pacifist, but I'm a really weird pacifist because I like to watch Kung Fu movies. All right. And so my wife, my wife uh, will sometimes like when she goes to bed, she's like, okay, you can watch your Kung Fu movie now. And uh, when I was a kid, uh, um, or maybe even when I was a teenager, there was a guy, um, it's not Bruce Lee, but it was uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. And uh, so he's a French guy who wasn't very good in real life at Kung Fu, but he was, you know, he was a handsome guy or whatever and was good enough on film. Well, there's this famous movie called Bloodsport that he was in. And I saw it the other night for the first time in like, I don't know, 15 years. And the whole movie is predicated on this idea of there being a secret um, uh, a tournament that's held called the Kumatai. And, um, and everyone from around the world is supposed to come and participate in this. And one of the things as I was watching the film, I noticed that there are only two people of color, two black people show up and both of them are portrayed as ineffectual, weak, and their fighting styles almost look like monkeys. And then all of the other sort of karate practitioners, a vast majority of them are white, and then there's a few Asian people. And it struck me that even here in this mood, so this is a movie made in the 80s, 84, 83, 84, 
where racial stereotypes are at play just in the, in kind of watching a Kung Fu movie. Um, and so that's the kind of thing I think then that bringing this stuff in challenges us uh, to consider in the kinds of movies and media that we see. And like, for instance, our, our commercials, if you watch, you know, certain commercials, um, how are people portrayed? Who shows up in those commercials? Whose voice is used in voiceovers, et cetera. So anyway, I, I just put that out to, uh, to think, uh, to think about that. Thanks. Um, just there was uh, Sarah had a comment um, about how we how do we encourage and support each other in pressing on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of us. And so, um, in this section, uh, just kind of the reflection is, you know, what what am I doing to perpetuate racism, and what can I do differently to um, to stop that and to do something different. And so um, the idea here is uh, the turning over the tables. So this is from Jesus. They came into Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And so as we look at um, the propaganda, the white saviorism, the, just all the different things that are coming out that are perpetuating racism at this time, um, think about, and just uh, with me together, we're just going to um, go into kind of a meditation and asking God to bring to our awareness um, something that needs to be overturned in our own thinking, in our own doing, in our own way of being. So thank you, God, that you are fully aware of what it is that needs to be overturned in us at this time and how we have not made your house a house of prayer for all the nations. We praise you, Jesus, for bringing to our awareness how we have either tried to transform or save black people to make us feel like we are doing good in your name, to make us feel more comfortable having black people around, or how we've tried to get away from black people altogether. I just want you to take a minute just to see what comes to mind for you, if there's anything specific. Um, and as you're doing that, there was a song that came up um, that was um, Luke, I believe. I'll have to go back and look. Um, I can't remember exactly which one I took it out of. One of the Gospels when Jesus enters the temple. Um, there was a song that was, um, by, a, a am not going to get this correct, but a, a music artist, um, at the poor people's campaign and, um, just kind of this lament of, um, you know, whoa, somebody's hurting my family. Somebody's hurting my brother. Somebody's hurting. And it's gone on far too long, far too long. Um, and we won't be silent anymore. And so um, as, we're, as we're thinking about this and as we're hearing that lament and that cry, I want us to be really intentional about, about, about seeking God on what is it that needs to be overturned? What am I doing that is perpetuating this? And what can I do differently to, um, to as Sarah had put in the comments before, you know, to, to create, a different, uh, create a different world? And so as we reflect on this, I just want us to know that like there are some quotes from this that are helpful in that. I did not fully realize that the only thing wrong with black people is that we think something is wrong with black people. I did not fully realize that the only thing extraordinary about white people is that they think something is extraordinary about white people. The anti-racists say there is nothing wrong or right about black people and everything wrong with racism. The anti-racists say racism is the problem in need of changing, not black people. The anti-racists try to transform racism. So what is one anti-racist thing I can do to better see the humanity, dignity, beauty, and value of Black people? God, thank you that there will come a time when we will love humanity, when we will gain the courage to fight for an equitable society for our beloved humanity, knowing intelligently that when we fight for humanity, we are fighting from our, for ourselves. And that is a quote from Ibram in the introduction. 
So this one, we're just asking for what we can do to turn over the things that are perpetuating racism and begin to do something anti-racist instead. Are you wanting us to share or are you, are you more just inviting us to reflect? Instead? I'm inviting you to reflect. I would love us to share, but I don't think we have time. So, um, yeah. If you would oh, like I to love share that in comments, please do. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, I really appreciate and love that invitation to, you know, what is God wanting to turn over <laughs> and um, both in within us and then just more broadly as well. Um, I don't know. And sometimes I think in these conversations that can feel like a, a sort of violence, but actually if we think of God as a loving, merciful, compassionate God, that it's actually, it's not an invitation, you know, it's not a oh, like that. It's actually a like, oh, like beloved one, like come more deeper into the fullness of who I desire you to be like, no, not this, not this. Um, but it's not, it's not to kill us, you know, or because I think sometimes right in these conversations, I know it can be like, oh, you know, but to, to experience that um, instead as this is the God of love who's inviting us and is actually for us and for all of humanity. And I love how you quoted that Kendi quote, when we fight for humanity, we're fighting for ourselves. And just to see the sense of like, we're all God's beloved children. And so by by us, you know, being working out the kingdom, <laughs> it's actually a kingdom that then is life for all of us. So thanks for that. We'll sit with that invitation. Yeah. And, you know, we go then to this last section. And I think just one of the things for those of you who did have an opportunity to read the book, um, I think, uh, let's see, like all of us who are present today on this, um, have been alive for some section of this 1963 to today. And, you know, so I think what becomes, um, I think for me, as I was reading it, what I was noticing is uh, the parts, I was thinking of some of you actually knowing that, like kind of the, you know, Arthur Rauner, Dave Williamson, like that whole era of leaders in our community, um, you know, like they, they're common in the 60s. I mean, that's when Rauner comes and just hearing some of the stories of, of that, knowing many of you were alive for this, you know, even the earlier days of the 1963 through today. And so I just noticed as I was reading this whole last section, and I don't know if any of you experienced this as well, is I felt grief at different points and all sorts of emotions, just knowing that this is actually my life. And, you know, some of these earliest, my earliest memories that I have in terms of kind of the political sphere of our lives, you know, outside of our homes. Um, my first memory was the Berlin Wall. My next memories were of the um, Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill trial of the, um, of like, I remember something vaguely about um, the LA riots from 91. And, and then I, like the first like real big consciousness I had was of 95 with OJ. And, you know, so these sorts of things that they're talking about in this section and what's going on, like I remember my own story from there. And I think that's one of the invitations as we think about um, this last section is this is like, where were you and how did these stories um, shape how you have thought, how you moved in the world? Uh, Etc. And so the the chapter then the first one starts back in um, 1963 and it, and it starts you know with naming the four girls who were killed in the bombing at the church in in Mississippi and some of you may have heard uh, Nina Simone who's one of my favorite um, music artists and um, this becomes a linchpin changing moment for her in her own music which she was a jazz you know vocalist and pianist. And she writes a song called Mississippi Goddamn. And, and it's the sense of like, what is going on in the world? And it really both animates um, her music to become, this isn't named in the book, but she, she becomes 
um, her music turns more towards civil rights more deeply. And um, it also coalesces with kind of the, um, the rising mental health concerns in her life. Like, because I think of how profound the violence and just her own grief about that. Um, and so that's where this chapter starts is by naming what's happening. It talks about, um, it talks about, I think just there's, there's these moments where I, I noticed, like I encourage folks, you know, notice what you're feeling or thinking as you're reading along in a text, you know, I'm reading along and I get to the top of, um, 172 and how it just names that JFK's approval ratings went down when he said there's going to be an investigation. And I just, I was like, what? Like, how is that even possible? You know, like at these sorts of moments when we're reading along and just paying attention to those sorts of things. And so this chapter then um, talks about, um, you know, what's going on and how, um, you know, George Wallace then, who is in Alabama, who is like segregationist now, segregationist forever, um, and how he actually gets all these positive le letters from Northerners. And so like, if you ever see, so when I read books, I'm always putting stuff in the margins, you know, so I have like double exclamation marks, like what is, oh, you know, just, cause that's not the narrative I grew up believing, right? I grew up believing Southerners were racist, that nobody in the North, we weren't racist, like, right? Gettysburg was won because of Minnesotans. Like, in case you didn't know that, we held the hill, you know? And so I'm thinking growing up, like we're the good ones, right? Um, and so just noticing and thinking through these things and I'm like, oh, right, this is a lot to sit with. And so continue on through that chapter. Um, they talk about Malcolm X. If you haven't ever read the biography, um, I would definitely encourage um, you to do so. And again, not we don't read things because we necessarily agree, but to hear the, hear the perspective and understand what they're naming and to just seek that greater understanding. And, um, you know, they're just naming what's going on with him and in his work and how um, at the same time, there's the movement for uh, civil rights, the Civil Rights Act gets passed, the Voting Rights Act gets passed, but then what they talk about in the text is there's a sense of, okay, great, now we're good. <laughs> you know, these sorts of women's like, okay, everything's, everything's just fine. Um, but then actually what we realize, of course, is that everything isn't fine. And so the next chapter details how literally six days after the Voting Rights Act, that's when, um, in the Watts neighborhood in LA, there was a police incident that set off a bunch of uh, reaction and led to, not it alone, but um, there ended up being the kind of reclamation of the word black as an identity and the movement then towards black power. And just again, one of those questions, like when you hear black power, that phrase, or when you've heard it historically, like what comes to mind? And I know when I was younger, like I was taught that Black power was about like harming and hating white people. And not that there absolutely weren't people in the movement who were like, I do hate white people. But that fundamentally, when you read here, like what's the platform, uh, it's actually about things like housing, education, full employment. And I'm like, oh, like, right? Like most of us would say we're pro these things. And so I think continuing to just also notice like when we're taught um, you know, implicitly or explicitly how to experience or hear one another or not hear, like how can we maintain curiosity and so um, so as to really hear what people are saying and what they're looking for. Again, a lot is made of um, in these sections about what's going on, like the connection between pop culture and um, the media and then what's also happening politically, uh, et cetera. And so just there's a lot of connections that are made here in these chapters a lot about Angela Davis, which I, I know some of her work, but I would never seen anyone kind of draw the through line about Angela Davis. So I thought that was um, really interesting how that was done and how they're, they're showing how there's all this stuff happening within the black community around writing and, and learning and, and putting out creative output. And so you have like Alex Haley's roots text is published and they're, they're contrasting that, you know, with what's happening to also, Kind of reclaim white power actually you know and so you have this all of a sudden the rocky you know movies come up and like again i don't know how many of you would ever thought of it like i grew up watching rocky and it I had never paused to be like oh wow what was happening that rocky became such a phenomenon like clearly rocky connected well there's so many different things going on right we have the cold war we have this kind of sense of a need to reclaim that um 
Like, how, how do we, we're feeling powerless, we're feeling afraid. And Rocky helps us feel like America's going to win. And, you know, the white, the white guy who struggled, like there's meaning in your story, but how not seeing how sometimes these narratives are actually sublimating or in response to uh, the rising up of the desire for uh, equality and to combat racism. And so that through line brings us into the time when I was born, the era of the war on drugs and crack babies. Um, and, and just then like the hip hop and what's going on with the music and Here's the thing, I'm reading this text and as much as like sometimes I'm gonna be like, oh, racism isn't a thing. Like how many he heard about crack babies? Like how many heard about super predators? How many folks were taught about welfare queens? How many people were actually told about gangsta rap and how terrible it was? You know, and I, so I'm reading this and I'm like, oh my gosh, right, this is present. And so I think that's part of the invitation then that they're wanting to bring us into is by saying, let's pay attention to what's been forming all of us, keep breathing, keep moving and pressing in. And, <laughs> and then as the t whole text ends, that really for them, all of this is it leads us back to the question of whether us as reader, do we want to be segregationists, who, who they name as haters overtly, which I'm assuming if you're here, you're probably not, but it's probably not your first interest. <laughs> Do we want to be assimilationist where it's just like, hey, let's not really deal with the problems? Or, and I love how they say, or do we want to be anti-racist? And they define that as someone who truly loves. And they say, the choice is ours. Don't freak out. Just breathe in, inhale, hold it, and now exhale slowly. So that's actually where we want to end. Um, Recognizing again, as Laura said, this is just the start of uh, our, or you know, one of those moments we didn't, I know, tie everything up today because uh, welcome to like the continued working out of all the things. Um, but just for us to pause for a moment to consider then that invitation to breathe and to keep breathing, keep inviting God's spirit in. And like the image, you know, from Psalm 1, to be that tree, like, can we root ourselves or thinking about how Jesus says these things too? Can we be that soil where the roots of God's goodness and love and invitation that all of humanity would be able to flourish and know life? And how might we be invited to continue to do that inner work to be people who are transformed so that we can continue to live more deeply? And so I just want to say an encouragement and kind of a final blessing to each of us to continue to root in, to continue to deepen in, to notice the grief, the pain, the confusion, all of the things, but to continue to turn towards God and towards um, one another, uh, to trust the work that God is up to in us and in the world, and that it's for our healing and for the healing of, of all of creation. And so we just want to end then by inviting us to just all, I'm going to invite everyone to close your eyes and open your hands. And as Laura started us, um, we're going to just breathe in together a few different times. Let's do that. We'll breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Christ, I give you thanks for the work of your spirit that is for us. God, might we continue to deepen into the good soil of your love. Might we be people whose lives bear fruit, fruit that is not poison, but fruit that is rooted and grounded in love. God, we do pray for your kingdom to come. God, we pray that we, um, we would just pay attention to your spirit's invitations for the places where some overturning is needed. 
Be with us, O Christ. May your spirit breathe in our community and in us. We give you thanks in all things. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Uh, again, we know this is only kind of scratching the surface. If you're wanting to like have more conversation about the text, about, I know it's 10.30, <laughs> it's 10.32. Um, if you're wanting to have more conversation and we wanted to bring us into the text knowing we're all coming from different places, um, I think what, what I would say is maybe, um, A, like, maybe just send a note and say you're wanting to, to do that or reach out to a few folks. You see some of the, the names and faces here. Like, I think let's continue the conversation next month. We're going to gather around a different text. Uh, it's a text by James Cone, who's a Christian uh, theologian, ethicist. Uh, it's called the cross and the lynching tree. And it's a deep invitation to what does it mean to be people who follow Jesus of Nazareth? and um, the ways both in which um, racism has been present in the church, but how Jesus is also like inviting us to take seriously uh, the call to be people who, who join with the God who in Christ was hung upon a cross, that liberation and salvation um, and healing might be for everyone. I think that's at least a halfway decent summation, but we'll send out more about that, about that text and invitation. We'll be doing that Saturday something, 20 something, something. And uh, yeah. Sarah, uh, it looks like Michelle has, um, she might have a comment to make really quickly. Yeah, uh, so I'm happy to help kind of connect people with each other. So if you want to email me that you want to have more conversations, I can kind of um, gather that information and put you guys together. So feel free to do that. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Michelle. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. We'll see you later. Good to see you.